Hello from Japan. Welcome to the World Nuclear Survivors Forum 2021. And we're very glad to begin here and very honored to have all of you together with us. This forum brings together nuclear survivors and impacted communities from around the world to virtually meet and exchange about their situations, needs, and initiatives. So uh, we can learn together and listen together to take actions to ensure their rights and dignities, and eventually to realize a world free of nuclear weapons. This forum is organized by PeaceVote in partnership with International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN. My name is Watana Verika of PeaceVote. Very nice to meet you. And I am one of the coordinators of our project, the Global Voice for a Nuclear Free World, PeaceVote Hibakusha Project. By the way, Hibakusha is a Japanese word meaning atomic bomb survivors. You're going to listen to this word very many times in this forum. And on this voyage, on this project, more than 170 Hibaksha traveled with us to the 100 cities in more than 60 countries. And last year, in 2020, we started a new project, its online version, in order to share their testimonies and experiences online with the people around the world. As the current situation means that we cannot travel in person, so we continue to convey those messages. Um, once again, let me take this opportunity to express my gratitude to those who support us in these difficult times. Um, where am I speaking to you from today? This large boat behind me is a tuna fishing boat called the Daigo Fukuryu Maru, or Lucky Dragon Number no. 5, which is based in the port of Yaizu in Japan's Shizuoka Prefecture. It was exposed to radiation from the United States hydrogen bomb test in Bikini Atoll of the Marshall Islands on March the 1st, 1954. The 23 fishermen on board were all exposed to radiation after the radioactive fallout or ashes of death rained down upon them. This boat was decommissioned in 1967 and abandoned in a garbage dump. When citizens learned of this situation, a movement to preserve the boat was launched and it has been restored and installed in this exhibition hall. Today, we're very happy to have three staff members of this exhibition, Yasuda Kazuya, Ichida Mari, and Hasume Mayusuke, who teach about the horrors of nuclear weapons through their visits here. Can you give us some words from you, please? Welcome to the Daigo Fukuryu Maru Exhibition Hall. This was established by the Tokyo government as a social education facility. Upon the calls of many citizens who called for a place to preserve and display this boat calling for peace, the government decided to create this place. Every year, more than 100,000 people gather here to visit, to consider and learn about the nuclear issues. This is Oishi Matashiti, who was a sailor on board this ship and experienced the nuclear testing at the age of 20. He continued to speak out about his experiences, wishing for a nuclear-free world until he passed away in March of this year. Here at the Daigo Fukurumaru Exhibition Hall, we also display information about nuclear survivors from around the world. Unfortunately, there is still not sufficient information or recognition about them around the world. Therefore, we hope that today's forum will be an opportunity for people to hear the voices of nuclear survivors around the world and to share the different common challenges. We're very much looking forward to hearing the voices, the experiences of nuclear survivors from all around the world today. Thank you very much. And also thank you very much for having us today here. 
And for more about this exhibition, please take a look at the video on our forum website. Now, we're very honored to share with you two messages to open this forum from Setsuko Taro, Hiroshima survivor and ICANN campaigner, who continues to inspire us all. And Ginny Garbonier, Vice President of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Greetings to all who have joined the Nuclear Survivors Forum. My name is Setsuko Thurlow. I am from Hiroshima, though now a resident of Canada. As a young girl, I witnessed my beloved city destroyed in an instant, incinerated by the heat of 4,000 degrees Celsius and contaminated by the radiation of one atomic bomb. I remember with children, men and women, done in agony without receiving any medical care or even a drop of water in this indiscriminate must. Thus, my beloved Hiroshima was the raised face of the earth. Even after 76 years, survivors are still dying today from the effects of radiation. Many of you participating in this forum must have similar stories to share of the unspeakable horrors and inhumanity caused by the production, ten, and actual use of nuclear weapons around the world. We are grateful that this forum gives us all an opportunity to deepen our understanding of our shared experiences, to ponder their meaning and to embrace each other with the greatest sympathy and support to build a strong collective voice for nuclear justice. Our voices are essential to the implementation process of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. At long last, we have a treaty that finally recognizes the disproportionate harm caused by the nuclear weapon production, testing and use to the in indigenous peoples, communities of color, and children. This boldly identifies the racism and colonialism embodied in the history and doctrine of nuclear weapons. The treaty furthermore makes a bridge from harm repatriations in the positive obligations that require assistance for victims of nuclear weapons, nuclear weapon use and testing and remediation of contaminated environments. I have profound solidarity with all of you. My deepest thanks for commitment to work for a world free of nuclear weapons. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today we pay tribute to the victims and survivors of nuclear weapons use around the world. 
Let me first thank PeaceBoat for this opportunity to share a few words with you at this important and timely event. The courage and determination of the Hibakusha and of all those affected by nuclear tests greatly contributed to make the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons a reality. The testimonies of those who survived and the memory of those who tragically passed away must continue to guide our efforts to rid the world of these inhuman weapons. Since the horrific bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, we, the International Committee of the Red Cross, together with the entire Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, have consistently called for the prohibition and the elimination of nuclear weapons, putting human security at the center. The treaty is a historic achievement. It is a victory for humanity and multilateralism. Nuclear weapons are immoral and now also illegal under international law. Indeed, considering their catastrophic humanitarian consequences on humans and on the environment, it is extremely doubtful for the ICRC that nuclear weapons could ever be used in accordance with international humanitarian law. While the harm caused by nuclear weapons cannot be reversed, the treaty contains important obligations to assist victims and decontaminate the environment. At the first meeting of state parties that will take place next March, states have a unique opportunity to agree on concrete actions to implement these obligations. To this end, the involvement of survivors will be crucial. We must better understand the needs of those harmed by nuclear weapons, in particular the impact of nuclear tests on affected communities. And we must ensure that these communities are fully informed not only of the risks and effects of nuclear radiation, but also of their rights under the treaty and other legal frameworks. Awareness raising and transparency should be at the forefront of states' efforts. Nuclear survivors can and should have a strong voice in shaping the treaty's implementation and the future of nuclear disarmament. This forum plays an important role in this respect, and I wish you every success in this important endeavor. Thank you. Thank you very much for the powerful messages. Here is Kawasaki Akira of PeaceBoard and ICANN. Kawasaki-san, please let us know more about what this forum is for and how it is structured. Please. Yeah, thank you. This forum is to bring together the voices of nuclear survivors so that we can listen to and learn from them. The first nuclear test was conducted in New Mexico in July 1945 after the process of developing developing atomic bomb secretly. Then in August 1945, the nuclear attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands of pe people. Then a nuclear arms race followed. When the US conducted the hydrogen bomb test in March 1954, thousands of boats like this one were sailing in the Pacific and affected by the radioactive fallout. Imagine over 2,000 nuclear tests have been carried out by the nine nuclear armed states contaminating our oceans and lands. Today, they were possessing over 13,000 nuclear weapons and modernizing them in the name of their national security. Whose security is this? In each stage of the nuclear chain, there are people whose health is severely harmed and their rights violated. I'm so excited to listen to more than 30 speakers over the coming hours and day for their testimonies and insights. At the same time, I'd like to acknowledge the many others who have gave input 
as we prepared for this forum, who we could not accommodate into the limited time frame. We cannot have a time dedicatedly to focus on the impact of nuclear power plant disasters, such as Chernobyl and Fukushima. Here in Japan, 10 years after the Fukushima disaster, a huge amount of treated but still contaminated water is planned to be released into the ocean, posing serious concerns for safety and accountability. We must face the fact that we cannot erase radiation. What we can do is prevent further nuclear disasters. This is why nuclear survivors and civil society groups have been appealing to the world for our own survival and for the environment that we need to carry over to the next generations. The adoption of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW, in 2017 was a milestone in this endeavor. The treaty entered into force in January this year, 2021, finally outlawing nuclear weapons. Mindful of unacceptable suffering of and harm caused to the Hibakusha and those affected by nuclear testing, the treaty's Article 6 provides the obligation for assistance to victims of nuclear weapons and environmental remediation. The first meeting of state parties to the TPNW will be held in Vienna in March 2022. Clear principles and concrete actions for the rights and dignity of nuclear survivors must be established. So this forum is divided into two parts. In part one, we will focus on the broad range of impacts, including from uranium mining, development, production, testing and use of nuclear weapons, and waste. We will learn not only medical, but also social, economic, and psychological impacts that many women and men, including indigenous peoples, have had to go through. In part two, we will shift our focus towards the TPNW and opportunities to together take action. The roles of young generations will also be highlighted. Each part will include both many testimonies via pre-recorded video and a live panel discussion. Please share your comments and questions via YouTube, which will be picked up by moderators and included by reporters in the forum summary to be made available later. Please also share any testimonies and other related reports so that we can add them to the forum's website. I hope in the closing session, we will have some common findings, understandings, and messages to the meeting of state parties to the TPNW and beyond. Lastly, on behalf of Peace Boat and ICANN, let me express my warmest gratitude to all sponsors for their contributions to make this forum happen, and all the supporting organizations as listed in the website. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much. And everybody, please stay tuned in for the next session um, featuring the first-hand stories from the impacted community. Let's, let's listen to the survivors together in order to take action together to realize a nuclear-free world. Hello, my name is Dimity Hawkins. I work for Nuclear Justice with the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons in Australia, and also through a new initiative called the Nuclear Truth Project. 
I am speaking today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations in Nam or Melbourne, Australia. I want to start by thanking our friends at Peace Boat for this initiative of the World Nuclear Survivors Forum. Peace Boat has a long history of bringing people together in conversation around loss and impacts of nuclear harms. The forum builds this global conversation as the world increasingly works towards nuclear abolition through the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. I grew up in Australia and in the South Pacific, which saw considerable nuclear testing in the last century. Here we know well the impacts of nuclear weapons testing and use do not begin or end in a day or a year, but extend over lifetimes, stretching beyond lines drawn on maps and through generations. But these weapons also have their origins in other nuclear activities, including uranium mining, nuclear power and processing, as well as weapons development. They all have their inherent risks and all nuclear activities end with the inevitable complication of nuclear waste. In today's stories, we hear testimonies provided by community members and organizations living and working on the front lines of the nuclear age. We will hear from people impacted by uranium mining, nuclear test downwinders, survivors of the first use of nuclear weapons and communities living with intergenerational harms. We will also hear about the struggle of survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This includes those who even today, decades later, are still working to be recognized as victims and to expand the definition of those impacted. You can't help but recognize in these stories both the incredible resilience and the strength of resistance of the people who truly lead our work, the survivors of nuclear harm. They help us shape an understanding of the breadth and the depth of what it means when we speak of victims and survivors of the nuclear age. Within these stories, you will hear of ongoing fights for human health and environmental justice. You will also hear of the generosity, the care and the solidarity within and between these communities, as well as calls for support. We hope that you will listen deeply to the stories so generously shared by these people, all experts in their lived experience. They offer intimate and compelling testimonies, stretching across different cultures, backgrounds and locations around our world. We thank every one of the people who have offered their stories and voices to this Nuclear Survivors Forum. And we thank you all for joining us, to listen with care, to consider deeply and to work towards nuclear justice bringing an end to all nuclear threats. Let's listen to the first story. Okay, my name's Sue Coleman Hazeldine. I'm a Gugudu woman from Sejuna on the far west coast of South Australia. I was very young when the bombs testing started happening in Australia. The winds brought the radiation fallouts to us. There was 12 tests held on Australian soil, including the Montebello Island. Now we have got proof of nine of them, which way the winds blew at the time. And um, we superimposed them and it was amazing to see Australia's legacy from the English and Australian governments as being totally black from the radiation fallout. The first image is of the bombs that were tested on Montebello Island, Emu Fields and Maralinga. This image shows the wind changes and then we superimposed the wind changes. The next image is of the whole radiation fallout across Australia. This is the legacy to Australia from the, the Australian and United Kingdom governments. Now, we've been living with grief and loss for a long time. There's been so many different cancers and, you know, so many birth defects. about grief and loss. Well, we live with it every day. 
it does not go away. Even 60 years later, babies are dying of really complicated defects that there's no explanation for. And we bury our babies. So the grief and loss does not go away. You know, we have suffered at the hands of the Australian and English governments. They have not cared that we are still suffering to this day, nearly 70 years later, and our children are suffering. Children all over the world are suffering because of radiation poisoning. You know, you've just got to look at Chernobyl, Fukushima. People everywhere have been touched with this poisonous substance. We really need the Australian government to join the rest of the world that is coming on board and outlaw nuclear, <laughs> out nuclear weapons, nuclear submarines, because if you've got no need for the radiation, you, there will be no need for the mines. And if the mines are shutting down, there will be no need for waste dumps which can be just as dangerous as any bomb. They start leaking. We won't know that that poison is seeping around through us again, just like the radiation fallout of all those years ago. Nobody knew what was falling amongst them, but everybody started to feel it. And as the years go on, we are still feeling it. We are still suffering. And we really do need the Australian government to stand up and say, enough. You know, we've damaged Australia, we've hurt the people. Aboriginal people have been dislocated just to please various mining companies, the uranium companies, you know, just everybody that wants something from Australia, the Aboriginal people get pushed aside. It's, it's just not fair. We're the First Nations people and we're the ones left behind in everything. So if we can stop mining on our country, protect our culture, stop the waste dump, tell the governments to think just to stop building nuclear submarines, the rest of the world can win too because there are animals out there that are dying and it seems like nobody cares, but we care. And, you know, I'm starting to get old and tired, but that's not the end of my fight because I've got children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren that are all ready and willing to stand up and fight and say no more. Give us a clean, nuclear-free future. My name is Jeremiah. And I live in Sedona. <coughs> I'm Jeremiah, and I live in Sedona, and I don't want a nuclear, and I live in, in Australia. Even though um, tiredness and age are starting to catch up on me, and I'm slowing down, my fight will continue, because I've got my children, grandchildren, coming along and standing up now and saying... Um, we don't want to be We want a green future. A lot of sickness through our family and, you know, I believe wholly and solely in my, what, what my wife <laughs> believes in. Well, that's about all I can say. And all you people out there, stay safe and stay strong. Bonjour. My name is uh, Joan uh, Morningstar. That's my uh, government name. And my um, the spirit name is uh, John Mon Anquitque, the South Cloud Woman. And I live at Miss Ugly First Nation. And it's um, about, one, about five miles um, west of uh, Blind River, Ontario. We're pretty well located between um, 
to St. Marie and St. Barry in between, about the middle. Um, in the early 80s, Chemical, when, back when they are named El Dorado, moved there and they um, put up a plant. While they are building it, they bought in a bunch of men, steel workers and everything to build the, uh, the plant. So there was uh, trailers used as uh, buck houses. I was hired to uh, work there. So I worked there and um, it was pretty, it was good to work there. Then I got laid off and there was no reason why they laid me off because nothing changed. So I was laid off for uh, two weeks and um, I wasn't given no reason. So when uh, they called me back, I know that some people were uh, different. They were uh, not really making eye contact with me and not really talking to me. And I had a friend there and I asked her, I said, what happened? I said, seems uh, different here. She goes, oh, nothing, and she walked away quick. So I went back to work that day. I sat down. I was uh, cleaning the last room, and I heard uh, music. So I thought I left a radio on in one of the rooms. There was uh, 10 rooms uh, per trailer. So I checked the room, there was no radio on. So I went back to the room, I sat down on the chair and I listened. And I could hear the music. It was a faint at first, but after a while it got louder. I could hear the drums. Then I heard men, women and children wailing, crying and a lot of sorrow. And at that moment, that's when I got choked up. My premier started crying because it was so sorrowful. So after that was over, that evening after work, I went to talk with uh, my mother-in-law. And I told her what happened, my experience. And she uh, said, it sounds like they disturb something there. She said, maybe a burial ground. She said, go back, she said, and talk to your friend and see if you can get some information. I said, okay. So I went back and I sat down with my friend and I said, tell me what happened here. Because there was a lot of uh, things happening at work. And so she looked at me and looked around. She looked back at me. She said, they told us and we told you that we would get fired. She said, but she said, they um, excavated. She said, there was a burial ground. She said, they had helicopters here and lights hooked up 24 at seven. She said, they took everything out. She said, the archaeologists and everything was there. So with that, she got up and left. And I went back that evening and I told my mother-in-law, yeah, they did dig up a burial ground. So she told me to make an offering and go there and make that offering with food and tobacco and that. And I said, okay. So that weekend, me and my husband, then we went by a canoe. We parked along the bank. We had to climb up on the bank because we uh, snuck on the land chemical. And uh, so we got to the tree line and we walked in. And that's when we could see all the indentations where they did the dig the rectangle squares and everything on the ground. So I went there to a few of them. I talked with them. I sent them for reaching out to me. And I once I could hear the drums and the 
sing and that everything again. I sat down, I started crying. And then we put our offerings all down, we left. I went back and talked to my mother-in-law. And she told me they reached out to you. She said, try to bring our people back home. So that's, that's been, you know, since about 1982 that I started this. And now it's 2021. 20, and um, I feel motivated again that maybe this time I'll get them home with the sacred items. Because I know when, when my people get buried, they get buried with their sacred items. I don't want them hanging up no more in the museum or nothing. They have to be buried again. And I just want to bring the people home. Joan, yeah. how far away is the um, refinery and the incinerator from your reserve here? Well, if you go, there's 1.6 kilometers. kilometers. But um, there's people on the other side of the highway that live um, closer. But you don't see none of that information in Camacos report because they always say refer to Blind River being the furthest uh, community. It's like Misogi First Nation is invisible to them. They got emergency evacuation plan for the golf course. They got emergency evacuation plan. There's a hydro yard over here. They got emergency evacuation for that. But no mention of Miss Augie, who lives right on their doorstep, basically. We have no emergency evacuation. If their bells went off today, do you think I could hear them? Mm. And because I got disabilities right now, I had cancer from, I believe, caused by the, that refinery. I got lung cancer, and from the lung cancer, the doctor said it was the first time they seen cancer attack the um, motor skills, fine and growth, the talking skills and the walking. So I'm doing better than I was last year. Do you think that's because you're so close to the refinery or do you think it might have something to do with the incinerator that they put in as well? Well, when they had the fallout way back in 1991, I think, or 1990, there was uh, over a hundred and some uh, yellow cake, I guess, that was uh, released. And I remember waking up that morning, our car, which was white, it was all covered with this um, yellowish stuff. Yellowish green stuff it was all covered. So I went out there and I took some of uh, the car with my hand my uh, husband, then he came out too and look, we didn't know what it is. But right now, I got cancer. He has cancer. He's my ex now, but he got cancer. The woman, my friend that lived at the door next door to me, she got cancer and died. The, the young girl that lived across the street from me, her kids um, has um, multi-health um, issues. And then this other friend wow. down at the street, her dog got breast cancer. The guy that worked at Camaco, not far from there, from where I live, he died of cancer. It's My, all over uh, the community, eh? It's people have been dying about every three months with cancer from here and from Blind River. I just heard another guy from Blind River. 
Wow, Joan, thank you very much. Bonjour, mes chers compatriotes. Donc, je me nomme Al Mustafa Al Sam, euh, coordinateur de la société civile d'Arlit, euh, le père fondateur de l'ONG Armand, une association des droits nigériens. Cette association, donc, qui est fait de euh, protection de l'environnement et de mieux-être, c'est-à-dire les droits de l'homme. Alors, nous sommes en train de poser un certain nombre de questions à Ourano. Ourano, donc, ex Sareva. Euh, avec ses filiales à, au Niger, c'est-à-dire ses filiales à Soumaïr et Cominac. Donc Cominac d'ailleurs vient de fermer en 2021 là. Et là ils sont euh, donc en train d'essayer ce qu'ils appellent le réaménagement d'ici. Donc c'est une situation extrêmement préoccupante pour nous parce que bon, c'est inédit euh, dans d'autres, euh, c'est quelque chose euh, qu'ils ont déjà fait au Gabon, à Monana et que 50 ans après, ils font exactement la même chose donc au Niger, c'est-à-dire d'abandonner la population avec de la radiation. Donc nous, ce que nous faisons, c'est de les rappeler et puis interpeller aussi l'État pour qu'en tout cas les normes soient respectées en matière de protection de l'environnement. Et que euh, de l'autre côté, euh, ce qu'on appelle le réaménagement du site soit fait en tout cas dans les normes. Voilà, donc le, pays, le Niger, c'est un pays où on produit de l'uranium il y a 50 ans, mais c'est le pays le plus pauvre euh, du monde. Et de l'autre côté, et puis bon, on nous laisse avec la pollution durable et toutes les maladies imaginables. Malheureusement, malheureusement donc c'est ça notre situation. Et c'est contre cela que s'élève un peu euh, l'ONG Agrement pour dire un peu non à ce genre de pratiques et ce genre de situations. Voilà ce qu'on peut vous dire, mes chers amis. Nous sommes avec vous et nous souhaitons quand même faire que notre voix soit la voix la plus forte euh, contre ces dangers d'uranium. La meilleure solution de gérer l'uranium, c'est de le laisser sous sol. Je suis convaincu que l'humanité a besoin d'électricité, mais on n'arrive pas à maîtriser les dangers de la, radio, de la radioactivité donc liés à l'uranium. Voilà ce que nous pouvons dire. Nous vous souhaitons un bon forum. Et nous vous prions de penser à nous pendant les forums. À bientôt. को मेरी ओर से जो है मेरा नाम घनश्याम बिरुली है और झारखंड के जादूगढ़ में रहते हैं जहां यूरेनियम माइनिंग होता है और यहां सात यूरेनियम माइनिंग है ये काफी मात्रा में यहां यूरेनियम का खुदाई चलता है और यहां मिलिंग भी है जिसके जहां पर यूरेनियम को पत्थर से अलग करने का जो प्रक्रिया है ये उसके कारण काफी मात्रा में यूरेनियम कचरा निकलता है और उसको इकट्ठा करने के लिए डंप करने के लिए टेलिंग पॉन कंपनी बनाती है जो गांव के बीच में होता है और इसके कारण काफी रेडिएशन का निकलता है और रेडिएशन के कारण यहां बहुत बड़ी समस्या उत्पन्न हुई है या महिलाओं का जो रेडिएशन के कारण देखने को मिलता है यहाँ बच्चे विकलांग पैदा हो रहे हैं और काफी मरे हुए बच्चे पैदा हो रहे हैं घर पात हो रहा है और मजदूरों में और यहाँ बसने वाले लोगों का टीबी और कैंसर जैसे खतरनाक बीमारियों से पीड़ित हो रहे हैं और वो और अभी काफी लोगों का किडनी खराब हो रहा है ये समस्या बनी है और इसके खिलाफ हम लोगों का संगठन है झारखंडी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन एजेंस रेडिएशन जो काफी समय से 20 वर्षों से हम लोग इसके खिलाफ आंदोलन कर रहे हैं और अब भी आंदोलन में लगे हुए हैं ये एक हमारे जीवन के लिए ये पूरा पर्यावरण के लिए ये बहुत ही खतरनाक है यूरेनियम माइनिंग के कारण लोग तो बीमार हो रहे हैं 
और कितने सालों तक इस पर्यावरण को प्रदूषित करते रहेगा इसका कोई ठिकाना नहीं है यहाँ का हवा खराब हो चुका है यहाँ का पानी प्रदूषित हो चुका है यहाँ का मिट्टी खराब हो चुका है ये पूरा ये जीने लायक ही नहीं है लेकिन लोग रहते हैं अनजान बन के या उस समस्या को समझ नहीं पाते हैं क्योंकि ये समस्या जो है विज्ञान के साथ जुड़ा हुआ है अगर हम किसी डैम से डूब डूबते हैं डैम से या आग से जलते हैं तो उसका असर तुरंत हमको दिखता है लेकिन ये हमेशा लंबा समय तक प्रभावित करने वाला जो समस्या है जो रेडिएशन का मामला है इस इसके बारे में हिरोसिमा और नागासाकी के लोगों को तो आ, उसका दर्द झेले हैं रेडिएशन का से होने वाली बीमारियों का दर्द झेले हैं और उस बारे में उस समस्या के बारे में अच्छे जान बहुत बढ़िया से जानते हैं हम ये कहना चाहेंगे हमारे देश के जो सरकार है और हमारे यूरेनियम माइनिंग का खुदाई करता है ये कंपनी जान बूझ करके ये समस्या को बताना नहीं चाहते हैं और इस समस्या को दबाना चाहते हैं हम लोग कम पढ़े लिखे लोग जो गांव में रहते हैं इस समस्या को जाने कि आज हमारा जो स्वास्थ्य का जो इतिहास रहा है यूरेनियम माइनिंग होने के पहले इस तरह का कोई बीमारी नहीं होता था हमारे लोग बहुत कम लोग मरते थे और काफी लंबा समय तक जीते थे लेकिन आज बहुत कम समय में लोग मर रहे हैं बच्चे विकलांग पैदा हो रहे हैं मरे हुए बच्चे पैदा हो रहे हैं ये बहुत बड़ी समस्या हमारे समाज के अंदर में हुआ है तो हम अभी ये कहना चाहते हैं कि जो भी हमारा ये वीडियो देख रहे हैं हम सबसे गुजारिश करते हैं कि पूरे दुनिया में जहाँ भी यूरेनियम माइनिंग हो रहा है या यूरेनियम कचरा डाला जाता है और वहाँ के लोग यदि प्रभावित हो रहे हैं तो उनको सपोर्ट करना चाहिए और यदि आंदोलित हैं तो उस आंदोलन को मजबूत करने के लिए प्रयास करना चाहिए तभी हम लोग बचेंगे अन्यथा हम लोग नहीं बच पाएंगे हमारा संगठन की ओर से मांग है कि टेलिंग पॉन्ड जहाँ पर यूरेनियम कचरा डाला जाता है उसके इर्द गिर्द बसने वाले लोगों का पुनर्वास सुरक्षित स्थान पर होना चाहिए और जो भी लोग रेडिएशन से प्रभावित है इस क्षेत्र के लोग या यूरेनियम माइनिंग में काम करने वाले मजदूर हों सबका सबको कॉम्पनसेशन मिलना मिलना चाहिए और ये भी हमारा मांग है कि हमारे इस क्षेत्र में और यूरेनियम माइनिंग नहीं होना चाहिए इस क्षेत्र के हवा पानी मिट्टी में कितना रेडिएशन का स्तर है उसका भी जांच होना चाहिए मेरा नाम डुमका मुर्मू है और मैं जोर का सचिव हूँ सरकार और यूसेल वाले यहाँ के आदिवासियों को गुमराह कर रहे हैं और और यहाँ जमीन लेने के लिए फिर जो आदिवासी के आदिवासियों को बीच में लड़ाई का एक षड़ रच रहे हैं लेकिन हमारे संगठन उनको कामयाब नहीं होने देगा और उस पर जो भी जैसा रणनीति अपना रही है विशेष हम उनको जन आंदोलन के तुर में उसको बंद कर देंगे हम लोग यही चाहते हैं कि हमारे भारत सरकार को इसके बारे में दबाव दीजिए कि यहाँ के आदिवासी लोग को आप बेघर मत कीजिए यहाँ जो उसका अस्तित्व है हक है जमीन है उनको जमीन से हक नहीं किया जाए ताकि वो बात उन तक पहुँचे जोहार ग्रीटिंग फ्रॉम झारखंड इंडिया एज यू नो वी आर झारखंडी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन अगेंस्ट रेडिएशन सिचुएटेड इन जादूगुड़ा झारखंड इन इंडिया एंड स्ट्रगलिंग फॉर मेनी डिकेड्स अगेंस्ट द यूरेनियम माइनिंग इट्स इम्पैक्ट ऑन हेल्थ एंड एनवायरनमेंट and raising voice to get justice for the radiation victim in this area as you know india is situated in very critical geographical location where its northern border chinese and indian armies are 
at war like situation last year itself many casualties happen in both sides even in this coldest winter and in that inhospitable situation number of troops in the both side of border are increasing and media reporting that chinese are rapidly expanding their nuclear arsenal and also developing and making nuclear silo in that area and in the western front the volatile situation of afghanistan pakistan and iran and in the southern side chinese are again building ports in indian ocean in sri lanka for last 7 years we have a right wing hindu nationalist party in power for them it is very favorable situation for their aggressive policies and propaganda there is no political party who can raise voice against the injustice done by the uranium company in this area also there is no match between the mighty uranium company and its powerful lobby and us their human and economical resources are limitless on the other hand we have just our culture traditions to fight with we tried all possible ways to resist and get justice for many decades we tried all possible ways protest on the street going to higher judicial courts going to international conferences ask reputed international institution to do studies here but all fail yes we are able to save our land traditional land but not able to get justice for the suffering of the people in this area on the one side company replace their aging employee with the new recruits and they continue with their dirty politics and propaganda on the other side our people our community and our youth are not equipped or not updated with the new information which is required to fight them so there is a need to have a group or a platform where mining affected communities who are mostly indigenous people all around the world they can come together they discuss their strategies their suffering their experiences and make strategies for strengthening the grassroots movement
My name is Mary Dixon. I am a downwinder, a survivor of nuclear weapons. Like tens of thousands of Americans, I grew up under the clouds of radioactive fallout during the years of nuclear testing. We drank milk from a nearby dairy, ate fresh vegetables from the garden, mixed sugar with snow to pretend it was ice cream, and played in puddles of rainwater in our tranquil Salt Lake City, Utah neighborhood. We were only children. How were any of us to know that a silent poison was threading its way through our bodies when a government we trusted repeatedly assured us that there is no danger and distributed pamphlets telling us not to let reports of Geiger counters going crazy bother us. We watched films warning against communist invasions, did duck and cover drills in school that were more like games, and didn't think about the Cold War that was raging or nuclear bombs that were regularly detonated in nearby Nevada. Between 1951 and 1992, the U.S. government detonated 100 nuclear bombs in the atmosphere and 828 underground. Winds carried radioactive fallout from those detonations, all far more powerful than the bombs that leveled Hiroshima and Nagasaki, hundreds, even thousands of miles away from the Nevada test site, exposing countless people downwind to deadly levels of radiation. The detonation that most haunts me is the one named Sedan. I had just turned seven when it was detonated on July 6, 1962. Though exploded underground, that one test released a plume of fallout 16,000 feet high that left a crater displacing 12 million tons of radiated earth, which went into that plume and fell out on my Salt Lake City neighborhood and far beyond. In my 20s, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. I underwent a thyroidectomy and subsequent radiation treatments. Every morning, a doctor came to my hospital door to point a Geiger counter at me to measure how hot I was. On my door and hospital bracelet were the radiation symbols. I was the radioactive material. When I left the hospital, they burned my clothes and told me not to be around pregnant women or try to get pregnant for a year. Another surgery meant I never could have children. As adults, my older sister and I began compiling a list of childhood friends and neighbors who had cancer, tumors, autoimmune diseases. That list numbered 54 people in a five block area of our childhood neighborhood. Two many of my classmates died, one of a brain tumor when we were eight. I remember wondering why she came to school with her head shaved. Four weeks later, her four-year-old brother died of testicular cancer. Another friend died of bone cancer at 16, others of brain tumors. No wonder one of my neighborhood friends said he felt lucky to make it to 40. In 2001, I added my sister's name to the list. She was only 46 when she died, leaving three young children behind. Now my younger sister is battling cancer and my youngest sister is being treated for autoimmune disorders. Of the Utah downwinders I worked with most closely, I am the only one still living. I listened with despair as one called me at the end of her life, tearfully begging me to help her die. A heartbreaking and impossible request. Another one told me before she died, you have to keep fighting for this because the rest of us are too sick. I feel an enormous responsibility to all of them to do this work. That's why I've spent decades researching, writing, and speaking about the human toll of nuclear weapons testing. Over the years, countless people have reached out to tell me their own devastating stories. The woman who lost three children to leukemia during above ground testing and is now seeing her three adult children battle cancer. The woman who lost her husband to cancer then felt her heart shatter when her five-year-old son, who had been diagnosed with bone cancer, woke up from surgery asking, Mama, where's my leg? I could go on for hours with heartbreaking stories of the harm wreaked on unsuspecting Americans by radioactive fallout. Barbara Rose Johnston, author of Half-Lives and Half-Truths, wrote, The arms race did not prevent nuclear war. It was a nuclear war. My late friend put it perfectly. We're victims of the Cold War, only we never enlisted, and no one will ever fold a flag over our coffins. 
the Cold War had casualties, and we, and too many others like us around this planet, are those casualties. We have suffered and continue to suffer. We've comforted the sick, buried and mourned the dead, and worried with each ache, pain, and new lump that we are getting sick again. Few Americans know the extent and staggering human cost of our nuclear past. We'll never know how many people were harmed, but we do know that it was far more than have ever been acknowledged. Sadly, most victims of nuclear weapons will never know they are. While other people carry pictures of their children in their wallets, I carry this map showing where fallout from atmospheric testing went. It was created by Richard Miller, author of Under the Cloud, The Decades of Nuclear Testing, after analyzing the government's own data. People are stunned when they see it. Fallout does not respect arbitrary borders on a map. No lead shield stops it at county or state lines. The jet stream carried it across the country where it fell to the ground in rain or snow and worked its way into the food chain and our bodies. That's how it was measured in my hometown in the Midwest and more than 2,000 miles away in Albany, New York. A National Cancer Institute study estimates that virtually everyone living in the U.S. at the time received some dose of radioactive iodine and that up to 212,000 cases of thyroid cancer alone may be linked to fallout. That's just one radioisotope and one fallout-related cancer. Radiation from 928 detonations doesn't just go away. Researchers are still finding strontium-90 that mimics calcium and is absorbed by bone and teeth in baby teeth collected in the 1960s. There is a large lag time between exposure and illness so that it takes 20, 30, or 40 years for some cancers to show up. People are still getting sick, their cancers are returning, health complications are showing up, the genetic damage affects new generations. We were patriotic Americans who trusted a government that not only betrayed and lied to us, but worse, considered us expendable. Declassified minutes of the Atomic Energy Commission during the early years of testing in Nevada read like high drama. When one commissioner lamented that people and livestock were getting sick and dying, another blasted, people have got to learn to live with the facts of life, and fallout is a fact of life. Nothing is going to get in the way of testing, nothing and he called for judicious handling of public information. Lying. What is the moral responsibility of a government that knowingly harms its own people? In 1990, U.S. Congress finally passed the Extremely Limited Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, RECA for short. Given the vast extent of testing, the number of claimants represents just a fraction of those harmed by radioactive fallout on American soil. When it was passed, President George H.W. Bush admitted it could only be considered partial restitution. What price, after all, can you put on human health and a human life? Nothing can bring back my sister and all the others. Our families and communities have paid and continue to pay an enormous price. Without congressional action, RECA expires this July. Bipartisan bills introduced in the U.S. Congress would extend it another 19 years and expand it to include seven Western states as well as Guam. For those of us who have suffered for decades and are burdened with ongoing medical bills, time is literally running out. Too many have already died. The legislation, though still not inclusive enough, is a step toward long overdue justice and atonement. Hopefully, Congress will do the right thing, even if it's too little too late. And just as importantly, those of us from nations around this globe who know firsthand the tragedy of nuclear weapons must stand in solidarity to bear witness and demand that the mistakes of the past never be repeated. Recounting our stories is incredibly painful, but we cannot let them die with us. In the move to ban nuclear weapons, our collective voices are absolutely essential. Nothing provides a more powerful incentive than our personal tragedies. My cancer, my sister's death, and the death of so many others has given me great motivation to end the nuclear threat. There is power in our words. The stories I listen to move me, inspire me, even as they dismay and unnerve me. We must break the stranglehold of the powerful military-industrial complex. We must do all we can to ensure that no government 
ever again sacrifices innocent human beings to the madness of nuclear weapons. Thank you. 안녕하세요. 저는 한국인 원폭 피해자 협회 회장 이규열입니다. 먼저 피스보드에서 핵 없는 세상을 만들고 세계 평화를 위한 운동에 참여하시는 피스보드와 관계자 여러분께 감사의 말씀을 드리고 특히 2021년도 세계 핵 피해자 포럼을 준비하고 개최한 데 대하여 어, 축하와 함께 격려를 보냅니다. 잘 아시다시피 지난 1월 유엔에서 50개국 이상 회원국이 비준한 핵무기 금지 조약 기구가 탄생하였는데도 불구하고 정작 핵을 보유하고 있는 미국이나 중국, 소련, 블란스나 영국 같은 강대국들은 이를 반대하고 미동도 하지 않은 채 아무런 움직임도 없이 특히 우리 일본과 한국은 핵 피해국이면서도 이 운동에 참여하지 않고 비준조차 하지 않은 것은 매우 유감스러운 일이라 아니할 수 없습니다. 우리 한국인 원폭 피해자는 1945년 8월 6일과 9일 일본의 히로시마와 나가사키에서 일제의 강제 강점기로 어, 강점 기간 중 어, 히로시마에 7만 명, 나가사키에 약 3만 명의 한국인이 살고 있었는데 에, 1945년 8월 6일 히로시마에서 또 8월 9일 나가사키에서 미국의 핵 공격을 받고. 어, 10만 명 넘는 조선인 피해자가 희생자가 발생하였습니다. 이로 인해 5만 명이 현장에서 숨지고 5만 명이 핵 피해를 입은 채 조국의 강복과 함께 귀국하였으나 모두가 숨지고 지금은 2,100여 명의 불가한 생존자가 있습니다. 인류 역사를 더듬어 볼때 핵, 핵무기는 그야말로 어, 어, 인류를 개멸시키고 어, 어, 온갖 지구의 생태계를 흔적도 없이 만드는 정말 위험한 병기입니다. 우리 피스보드와 함께 세계 평화를 추구하는 우리 인류들은 핵무기 없는 세상을 만드는데 모두가 앞장서야 할 것이며 특히 원폭 피해를 입은 피해자 당사자들은 더더욱 핵무기 폐기 운동에 앞장서야 할 것으로 생각을 합니다. 핵 피해자에 대해서 추가로 제가 말씀을 더 드린다면은 음 우리 핵 피해자 1세대는 말할 것도 없고 2세와 3세대의 그 후유증이 심각하기로 이루 말할 수 없습니다. 원인 모를 병마와 함께 시달리는 우리 2세, 3세 후손들의 실태는 그야말로 말할 수 없을 정도로 병마와 시달리고 있고 또 원인을 모르니까 제대로 치료조차 하지 못하고 있는 그런 실정입니다. 이러한 것들을 볼때 정말 핵 피해자의 당사자로서 너무나 안타깝고 
어, 보기 힘들 정도입니다. 아무튼 오늘 피스포트에서 주최하는 2021 세계 핵 피해자 포럼이 성공적으로 잘 이루어지고 하여 핵 무기가 지구상에서 사라지고 핵 없는 세계 평화가 이루어지기를 간절히 바라면서 말씀을 마치겠습니다. 감사합니다. 21st July 2021, 84 Hiroshima Brooklyn survivors got a groundbreaking victory at Hiroshima High Court. The court ordered government to designate Brooklyn survivors as official hibakusha and provide state health care like other hibakusha. The government ignored their suffering for 76 years and excluding them from its aid regime set up in 1957. The Reason Council of Black Rain Survivors groups petitioned local and central government for more than 30 years and finally appealed to the court in 2015. It took six years to win. This is too long for elderly plaintiffs. 19 passed away during the trial, but this victory will save estimated 13,000 survivors in Hiroshima, other than plaintiffs. It is certainly in great local news, but I think its implications are also global. Here, I explain how Black Rain survivors have been excluded from the state aid regime and how their experience was denied for half a century. Then I discuss the meaning of this achievement and its possible global impacts. The Atomic Bomb Medical Treatment Law was enacted in 1957. This was the first stage registration supporting atomic bomb survivors. Without any state help for more than a decade, many survivors were trapped in the vicious circle of deteriorating health and serious poverty. They also had to live with constant anxiety and the shadow of death. Knowing this predicament, local doctors started to petition for state support along with the Hiroshima city government. The movement to ban nuclear bombs triggered by the bikini testing also created a national tide demanding registration to save survivors. The medical law provided state medical service for survivors who had radiation related illnesses. But importantly, it also provided free medical checkups to survivors who had not yet developed any radiation related illness. It aimed for early detection and rapid cure. This expresses the very principle of the law to eliminate the fear of the hibakusha. The court decision this year rightly recalled this principle and demanded that the government followed the spirit. The target of the medical law was hibakusha, defined and classified into four categories. These were carried on into the Atomic Bomb Survivors Support Law enacted in 1995. Category 1, direct hibakusha. Category 2, entering the city hibakusha. Category 3, those exposed to radiation but not in the above two categories. Category four, children in the womb. The third category is intentionally ambiguous. Lawmakers primarily thought of survivors who took part in risky activities or disposed of the dead. However, they also assumed other possible cases which they had not even thought about with very limited scientific knowledge about radiation. The court this year Judge the Black Lane survivors should be in this third category. Then why did the government forget about the spirit of the law and wrongly underutilize the third category for such a long time? Despite its good principle, the medical law disappointed many in the beginning. 
because of its very limited services for a small number of beneficiaries, local governments and doctors strongly petitioned their efforts result in a new law in 1968 and revising the medical law six times until 1976. The stint expanded designated areas and increased expenditure for the aid regime about 250 times in 20 years. This attitude, however, dramatically changed in the late 70s. In 1980, the government declared that it would never expand the designated area without scientific and rational evidence. The reason council petitioned but all were rejected as unscientific. Then what is the government science to reject the survivor's realities? The government science officially recognized two sources of radiation, which caused tangible health damage on Hibakusha. The main one is the initial radiation emitted in the air within a minute of the explosion. The other is induced radiation in which neutron rays interacted with such elements as the nuclei of soil. In both sources, its science only considers external exposure and hence the amount of radiation is the key to defining its health effect. On the other hand, the government has consistently denied the health effect of the fallout, so-called ashes of death. U.S. Army official Thomas Farrell said in 1945, Hiroshima atomic bomb was burst so high up in the air that no radiation exists in Hiroshima. Surprisingly, the government expert in this black rain trial argued the same until today and rejected any possible health effect of the fallout because its very low dose could have done no harm through external exposure. The plaintiffs argued totally the opposite. They testified the fallout down, poured down on a very wide area, reaching 30 kilometers from the hypercenter, and most plaintiffs had developed radiation-related illnesses, including even acute symptoms. Lawyers and scientists supported them by explaining the mechanism of spreading blood playing areas and argued health effect of internal exposure by air and food and even with a tiny dose. The court accepted the plaintiff's claim and rejected government so-called science. The Japanese government accepted court judgment on 29th July but the next day, the prime minister issued a strange comment against the judgment. Quote, the government cannot admit health effect of internal exposure, regardless of the scientific dose estimation, because this is contradictory to the philosophy of the Hibakusha aid regime, unquote. This could not disturb the court decision, but show the government's predicament. The initial exposure and low dose effect not only contradicts its aid regime, but it was also quite inconvenient for the whole national nuclear policy, including energy and deterrence. Both are also pillars of the NPT regime, which the Japanese government ratified in 1976 and has been deeply committed to since then. Moreover, recognition of low dose effects from internal exposure logically discredited Japan's authoritative Hibakusha data, namely the lifespan study. It's more than 16 years of epistemological study targeting 120,000 subjects, including 94,000 Hibakusha. This data has been utilized for setting radiation protection standards around the world. However, its research design itself ignored low dose radiation and the internal exposure underestimating those risks. This court case made clear that this data cannot protect people from risk of low dose radiation. The global impact of this judgment could be huge. Now the Japanese government has two choices of abandoning the precious Hibakusha data or reorganizing it into a more reasonable one. 
Of course, I hope for the latter. We need a more scientific and rational radiation protection regime to ensure rights and dignity of nuclear survivors and also prevent more nuclear victims around the world. Thanks for listening.